We're going to be studying the Psalms. This is actually the second half of lesson number 10. Uh, last week, in uh, the beginning of lesson 10, we talked about the various types of poetry, uh, talking about poetry in general and how Hebrew poetry is different than we might consider English poetry or Western poetry. There's no rhyming is, is not really the issue. It's, it's more the parallelism where the second line will say the same thing as the first line or will say the opposite of the second line um, or it will build upon itself. There was synonymous parallelism. There was antithetical parallelism, synthetic parallelism, step parallelism. And then we also talked about acrostics where, for example, the best example, Psalm 119, is divided up into 22 sections of eight verses each. Each, eight, each of those eight verse sections correspond to a uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And since there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, each of those eight verses then handles one letter until you get down to the very end. And uh, the last uh, eight verses are the last verse or the last uh, letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And of course you find that also in, in Lamentations as we noted last week as well. So now we wanna actually go into and look at the Psalms, which are poetry, and talk about the different kinds of Psalms and how to interpret them. Um, so before we do that though, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful for, as the scriptures say, the sweet Psalmist of the Lord, King David, the great King, who wrote so many beautiful hymns to your great name and for your great name's sake, that we might rejoice in them, that we might find comfort in them, that we might also see how the great saints of the past have also struggled with the same struggles we have but also rejoice as we rejoice and it's comforting to know that uh, even throughout the the uh, millennia that the people of God also can trust you and can lean upon you and can come to you in prayer and in thanksgiving and in joy and in weeping and find you a great and merciful and sufficient God in all of our in all of our needs so as we look at the Psalms today, we, we pray, Father, that we would rejoice in them and that we would see in them a reflection of, uh, of, of the great saints of the past, David in particular and others, who went to you in prayer that we might also find instruction and guidance to do the same. So bless us as we study the Psalms tonight. And again, may your name be praised as we come together to look into the proper interpretation of your word. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, first of all, we want to look at introduction to Psalms. Psalms is the largest book in the Bible, containing 150 Psalms or songs. As we study them, keep in mind several characteristics of the Psalms. And I'm not sure if all of this is in your notebook or not, but keep in mind, first of all, as you see on uh, PowerPoint number one, uh, actually this is uh, PowerPoint number 12. Uh, it's the first one for tonight, but it's PowerPoint number 12 in lesson 10. First of all, note that they are poetry. And since they are poetry, are they written in referential or are they written in commissive language? Commissive. commissive. Remember, referential is reference material. Commissive is more emotive or emotional type material. Songs, poems, uh, those sorts of things are commissive language, whereas referential language are things like textbooks, uh, technical data, <clears throat> blueprints, of uh, medical texts and those sorts of things. So they're written in commissive language. Despite being poetry, they still express objective truth. So for example, if you go through the Psalms and you see a Psalm that says, God flies on the wings of the wind, that's commissive language. It's not meant to be taken literally. God doesn't literally fly on the wings of the wind. First of all, God has no body and, and, and wind has no wings. But the point is, is God is fast. He comes to your aid speedily. That's the whole idea behind that. As fast as the wind. And you, and you see other things like that throughout the Psalms. The heavens declare the glory of God. Do they actually say anything? Well, the answer is no. But they reflect God's glory because of their beauty and, and their majesty. Since the historical personal experiences of the psalmist are different than ours, and since he expresses himself in culturally conditioned language, we must be vigilant in search of implications and significance to make application for our life and condition. So when the psalmist says, the Lord makes my fingers ready to fight, and he makes me so that I can bend a bow of bronze, what does that mean for us? 
when I go hunting this fall, by golly, they're in a the deer that's going to be able to stand in my presence. No, that's not what he's saying there necessarily. But what it means is he gives strength for whatever trial is coming my way. And since David was a soldier, he was using the illustration of being an archer in battle. God is our, our refuge and strength. Uh, God is our, the horn of our salvation. God is our high tower. Uh, that just simply is referring to things like security. God's not really a tower any more than he flies on the wings of the wind. But the idea is they're getting across objective truths that are put in their own cultural language. God is, you know, the, you know a soldier today might say instead of, you know, he gives me the ability to, you know, to, yeah, use a machine gun. Or he makes my aim true. Uh, he, he causes my artillery shells to, to fall in the right place or whatever. I mean, just that sounds kind of silly. It sounds much more plausible in the Psalms. Um, but, you know, a soldier might say he might take confidence in that, that God will give me courage in battle. He'll give me, he'll give me success when I'm fighting for that which is right. Fourthly, though all of the Bible is given by God to us, the Psalms are also man's expression of faith, hope, pain, joy, and sorrow back to God. That's in a sense what makes Psalms, I don't want to say they're unique, but that makes them a little bit different than some other things. Because we'll notice that when we get to the end of our lesson tonight when we start talking about imprecatory Psalms. What's an imprecation? Does anybody know what an imprecation is? Calling down a curse upon somebody. Bash them in the teeth, oh God, you know, break the jawbone of my oppressor. Also, fifthly, psalms are a great aid to worship and were used by the Jews as such. They are great means by which we too can express ourselves to God in worship. Looks like I've got a typo there too. Great, G-R-E-T-T. -T. That's at least what it is in my notes. I don't know if it is in the PowerPoint or not. Yeah, yeah well, I'll fix that. Fix, F-I-C-K-S. <laughs> <laughs> The Psalms are usually identified with King David. They were written by a variety of individuals over a long period of time, however. Usually we think of David when we think of, you know, because he is referred to in the book of... Uh, How long I've been going. It's on. Okay. Uh, sorry about the glitch in the in the video. We're going to go ahead and just carry on from where we were. We were just talking about the Psalms, how Psalm 150 
is um, a doxology for the whole collection of Psalms. Each book of Psalms, uh, there's one book of Psalms, but the Psalm book itself is divided up into five sections or five books. And each one of those books ends with a doxology. And in chapter 150, Psalm 150, is itself a doxology. It's just one great big praise. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. So it sort of acts as a summary, as it were, of the entire book of Psalms. Now, there are different types of Psalms. And this will this will get the counter going there, Randy. When you it doesn't work until you start clicking it. But at any rate, there are different types of psalms. There are different classifications or types of psalms. The types of psalms differ in their content and purpose. Though there is broad consensus on the classifications, it seems no two scholars agree completely on how they should be classified. Furthermore, some psalms don't seem to fit any particular type, and some contain elements of more than one type. You might have a lament psalm that has a great big bunch of praise in it. You might have a nature psalm that has a great big lament in it. You might have a lament psalm that has a bunch of nature stuff in it or something like that. We will deal with those types that are more or less agreed upon by everyone. First of all, there are lament psalms. Lament psalms say exactly what they say. That is, they are laments. They are, they are expressing sorrow or sadness. This is the largest category of psalms, including approximately 48 psalms. There are two subcategories of lament psalms. There are individual laments, and I don't know if I have this in your notes or not, but an individual lament is where a person says, How am I distraught, O Lord? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22. O Lord, how long will you ignore my cries? And in Psalm 3, Psalm 4, Psalm 5, Psalm 6, Psalm 7, 17, 22, 61, and 140. You don't have to get all these, but these are, these are all individual lament psalms. I am sad. I am distraught. So there's more? Oh, there's more than that. There's 48 total. And there, there's more individual laments than that. And there's also corporate lament. We are sad. We are distraught. Psalm 137 is a classic example of a corporate lament. Also, 44, 85, and 90 are corporate laments. And again, like I said, you just notice the language. If it's in, if it's in, if it's in uh, first person singular, then then it's a uh, it's a personal or an individual lament. But if it's in third person singular or second person singular, I should say we, then uh, I know, yeah, third person, f- first person plural. <laughs> Better go back and take some English. First person plural, we, then that's obviously then it's going to be a corporate lament. As we can note from Psalm 13, lament psalms have a basic pattern which applies generally to all laments. Turn to Psalm 13. All right. This is this is a, a rule of thumb here, as it were. This is a this is generally speaking, this is how lament psalms work. However, th- th- though there are like five elements in a lament psalm. Not all elements are in every lament psalm, nor are the elements always in the same order. Okay? Now notice in Psalm 13, what do we see here? First of all, it starts out with an address to God. How long, O Lord? All right? You got the address to God. Then there's a lament or the description of the need. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Notice again the first person singular. It's I and my and me and so forth. Having sorrow in my heart all the day, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? So there's there's the actual lament. There's what's going on where he says, I need your help, Lord. So we got Lord, which is the address, then the lament or the description of need. Then you have the petition for prayer or for help, verses 3 and 4. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes where I sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. So there is the prayer. There is the petition. This is what I need done. O Lord, you're not listening to me. What's going on? Things are screwed up here. And here's why. So that's the petition for prayer and help. Then there's confession and confidence. But I have trusted in your loving kindness, verse 5 says. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. So here in in PowerPoint number 14, 
we see these basic ideas here. You've got the address to God, the lament, the description of need, then the petition for prayer, the confession of confidence in verse 5. I've trusted you. My heart will rejoice. And then verse 6 is a vow or confession of praise. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So you see those five basic elements there. So there's, there's these five things that are part of a lament psalm. Now again, not all lament psalms have all five of these, nor are they necessarily in the same order. Turn to Psalm 3 now. And we want to look now at, uh, at PowerPoint number 15. I forgot to turn to number 14. So number 14 has Psalm 13 on it. But now we want to compare Psalm 13 with Psalm 3. Now remember in Psalm 13 you had the address to God. How long, O Lord, in chapter uh, or in verse 1a, the first part of the verse. And it's the same in Psalm 3. In Psalm 3, he says, O Lord, there's your address to God again. Now, in Psalm 13, in, in verses 1 and 2, you had the lament or the description of the need. And you have the same thing in Psalm 3. Here's the need in verses 1 and 2. My adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. They are, many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. All right? So there's the lament. There's what's going on here. Now notice, in Psalm 13, the next thing was the confession and the, uh, the next thing was the petition and prayer for help. Here it's the confession and confidence. So it reverses the order. You should see the little arrows there on PowerPoint number 15 to show you where these things have re been reversed. So the third and the fourth elements of the Lament Psalm have been reversed here in Psalm 3. So you have the petition for prayer for help in Psalm 13, but now you have confession and confidence in verses 3 through 6 in Psalm 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. So there's the confidence. I have confidence in God. He's going to give me rest. He's going to give me victory. Then in verse 7 is the petition. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have smitten all my enemies in the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. And then at the end, just like in the other psalm, you have a vow of confession in verse 8, which says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. So you see how the five elements are there. They're just not quite in the same order. Now, Let's go to a more radical departure from the norm. Turn to Psalm 137. One thirty-seven also has an imprecation in it. It's a lament psalm with a very, very harsh imprecation in it. But I want you to note verses one through four. Here's the lament or the description of need. So that's the second thing in Psalm 13, but it's the first thing in Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the wallows in the midst of it, we hung our harps, for our captors demanded of, of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Ha, ha, ha. Now this is during the captivity. This obviously was not written by King David. King David lived about a thousand years before the time of Christ. The Babylonian captivity that he's referring to here was between 605 and 536 BC. So it's 500, 400 to 500 years later, after King David. So this was written many years after King David. But look, they're making fun of us. Hey, all you Jews that were so happy in your foreign land, sing us one of your happy songs. Ha, 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 you're not so happy now, are you? Because we rule over you. You're our captives. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Verse 4 says. So there you have the lament. Then you have a vow and confession of praise. That's the uh, last thing in Psalm 13, but now it's the second thing in this psalm. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So there's like a, 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 a confession, a vow. I'm not playing anymore until I see your face again, we might say. I'm not going to play anymore until we return back to our homeland. 
then there's an address to God. He hasn't even um, really talked to God yet. He's speaking somewhat abstractly. But now he says, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, tear it down to its very foundation. So there's the address to God. And then the petition for the prayer for help. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom. Come to our aid against these people who are so happy to see us destroyed. And then there's the confession, the confidence, and this is an imprecatory form. And this is kind of gruesome, and we're going to talk about this in just a little bit. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. It's kind of a horrific thought. If we're supposed to love our neighbors, how can we have that kind of thing in the Bible where we wish harm and devastation such as that to our enemies? Well, again, we'll talk about that. But you see how the, the, the order of, is radically changed in this lament psalm. It's much different. A little bit more macabre as well um, in at least the, the one element. So that gives you the flavor, however, for, for lament psalms and a comparison of lament psalms to give you an idea that all lament psalms are not the same. All right, next is praise psalms. Praise psalms, these are on the opposite end of the scale from laments. Here the psalmist praises and glorifies God. Some are narrative praise, what God has done for me or for us, and some are descriptive praise, what God is or what he has done objectively as in nature psalms in Psalm 104. Look at how God works in nature, how beautiful nature is, how God glorifies himself in nature. Praise psalms can be further classified into individual praise. So you can have, a, you can have an individual narrative praise song, look what God has done for me. Or you can have a corporate descriptive praise or an individual descriptive praise or a corporate narrative praise or, or whatever. So there's a, a little bit more variation here. But praise psalms can be further classified into individual praise like 18, 30, and 116, and among others. Or corporate praise. 67, 98, 124, and others as well. Now some have distinguished between praise psalms and thanksgiving psalms, but because of their similarity, I'm not going to mess with that. You know, we praise God because we're thankful. We're thankful because he's praiseworthy. <laughs> you know, as, as, about as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's, you know, that's good enough for our purposes. Now, like lament psalms, do you, ha you have all this? I don't want to go on until you have it all. You don't have to write all these numbers down either as far as what Psalms goes. You're going you're gonna to learn how, you, I'm hoping that you're learning how you'll be able to spot them. When you come across the Psalm, say, hey, this is a lament Psalm. This is a praise Psalm. This is a corporate lament. This is an individual praise. Now, <clears throat> like lament Psalms, this is PowerPoint number 17, praise Psalms follow a general pattern. Though they are not all identical, a classic example of the praise format is the shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. Turn to Psalm 117, two verses. This would, I, perhaps this would be the equivalent of their worship chorus, <laughs> as opposed to their hymn. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. There's the opening praise. Laud him all people. So there's the, there's the opening praise, verse 1. Why? For his loving kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. That's the description of what God has done or the reason for the praise. In verse 2, A, B. You know what I mean by when I say A and B? Like you can divide it up into phrases or sentences. A would be the first phrase, B is the second phrase. So the opening praise is verse 1. The description of what God has done, the reason for the praise is verse 2, A and B. And then the closing praise is 2C, praise the Lord. Very easy. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all his, ye people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord abides forever. Praise ye the Lord. So there is a classic example 
of a praise psalm. All right, gang. Turn to Psalm 113. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, this is a praise psalm, okay? But tell me. It's very short. It's only nine verses, relatively short. Um, I want you to look it over here very quickly and tell me, is this a narrative or descriptive praise? Why do you say descriptive? You're right, by the way. Saying what God is or what He has done objectively. It's right. Not, it's not it's like. Not, or like me, us. Well, and, and not only that, but if you see a, if you see a narrative praise, it'll be like a psalm where it'll say, "And God delivers us out of Egypt. Uh, you know, His mercy it's endures specific, forever." Like a specific example. It'll it'll go to an historical event and walk you through it. Or, you know, it'll talk about, you know, some event in Israel's history, right? Or that's just another way of saying the same thing. So this is a description of what God has done or what God does. He's high and, and who he is. He's high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. No one's like him. He humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust. He's not talking about a specific historical. He's just talking about in general, here's what God does. We can describe him as being what? Okay, when he says, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. What does that mean? Well, there's this guy, he was laying in an ash heap and God came along and picked him up. Or is he using poetic language to, to get across what idea? Salvation. Salvation or deliverance from an enemy. Yeah, or deliverance from his poverty. But he's not literally talking about picking somebody up out of the ash heap. Ashes were a, were a, a sign of, of lament uh, and remorse. So if you were, if you'd lost a loved one, you might, re, uh, you might cover yourself with dust and ashes. Out of, Job did that because of his sorrow and because of his lamenting. But God raised him up out of the ash heap and out of the dust. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So it's, it's a descriptive praise. It's not a narrative. He's not saying, well, you remember that time that we were, you know, fighting this battle and the, you know, the Edomites came or whatever or the Amalekites came and here's what God did on our behalf. Remember that? Clear back in the book of Genesis. He doesn't do that here. All right. What are, we've already done this a little bit, but let's look at a verse here. What does it mean? What, what would be the uh, meaning uh, of, let's see. He humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. What does that mean? Is that verse 6? Yes. Who is like God who humbles himself to behold the things that are on earth? Jesus. No, I don't think so. I think it's just talking about God. I don't want to say generically. That sounds kind of uh, irreverent. But it's just talking about God, you know, as a, as a person from the Old Testament perspective. Remember, we're looking at this from the perspective of the Old Testament saint now. How, how would he, what would he be thinking about when he was thinking about God and his majesty? He wouldn't be thinking about Jesus per se. He'd just be thinking about the glory of God. Yeah, the glory of God, the holiness of God, you know, how, how um, elevated he is. Okay. He's, he's, he's lowering himself. He's stooping down. And not, and he cares about us. He cares. There he's you go. He's stooping down to... If, if I was over there with a marker in my hand, I'd give you a star. Because that's, that's what he's saying. God is not so far off that he couldn't... He's not a deistic God where he, he's unconcerned with the things of this earth. Despite the fact that he is high and lifted up, like in Isaiah chapter 6, he still cares about the poor and the needy. He cares about the barren woman. He wants to bless her with children. And even the barren woman, she make, he makes a joyful mother of children. Let's look at that one. What does that mean? 
Or let me let me ask you, what are the what are the implications of that one? Remember the implications. What else would fit within that pattern of meaning? Verse nine means he settles the barren woman in her home. Okay. Now let me ask the question. Does every barren woman have children of her own? How else then might this be fulfilled? Adoption. Caring, caring for orphans. Caring for orphans. You talk to Diane Haywood. I'm not putting her on a. I'm not. I'm not talking out of school. Um, it, it, I'm praising her. She's never had children of her own, but you should have seen the way she took care of her mother. And she and she said she said my mom was my kid. And she just loves kids to death. She loves those neighborhood kids, and they fill her heart with so much happiness and joy. And God brings kids into her life, and you know, and it makes her feel really happy, and, and she rejoices in that. So, you know, yeah, I think he had. He, I don't think he specifically had that in mind as he wrote this psalm, but that's an implication we can draw from that. That God blesses in other ways as well. Might give somebody a, a job in a nursery school. Can't have children of their own, but now I've got thirty. And I love them all to death. And I've got 30 new ones every year, you know, or whatever. I know it's not the same, perhaps. Um, but still, you know, God has a way of, of blessing in, in left-handed ways sometimes, you know. And, uh, and so I think that would be an implication, a valid implication here. Aha. <laughs> Probably all scratchy and everything, too, the Bible on top of the microphone. Um, so there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's implications here that would go, and who else? Does he only give mothers children? Does he give, who else maybe children? Fathers, right? You know, Abraham and Sarah both received a son. They were both blessed with the child of blessing, right? So, you know, there's implications that go beyond this. And, and, the, and, the, and the, so the meaning here is, what's the overall meaning of this psalm? That he cares about us and looks over us and looks after us and right. provides for us. We should, we should praise him because he's always watching out for us. He blesses us in, you know, he uses some specific ways, but the idea is, is that we can praise him because even when we're down and out, he's there for us. Even when we feel lonely, he's there for us. And he, and he, and he somehow fills those voids. He defends you know, the weak. So when I'm down and out, when I'm weak, when I feel at the bottom of the barrel, you know, God comes through for me. That's, that would be the significance then, right? The personal application. All right. So that would be, you know, we could have outlined this, right? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forever and ever, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is be praised. Let me ask you a question. From the rising of the sun to its setting, what does that mean? What else could it mean? What else could it mean? How about everywhere? From the east to the west. Mm. Which I've, I've read commentaries, and that generally seems to be the consensus. He's not talking about all day long, but everywhere. Mm. Praise the Lord. Uh, and he does say all time, this, this time forth and forever. Uh, and maybe maybe the reason they say from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised, because look at the next verse. The Lord is high above all nations, from east to west. But yeah, certainly all day long would, would be, I think, an implication in there, because the idea is the majesty of God is all-encompassing, and his praise and is all-encompassing. So that would be, I think, your opening praise. Um, and then the, the description of his praise would be what? Which verses? Five through nine. Five through nine. A. 
and B, perhaps, it depends if you want to break that down. And then the praise the Lord, the very last phrase, would be the closing praise. Now, oh, I did it again, didn't I? Now, is this individual or corporate? Look carefully at the first few verses. O oh, servants, servants of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. Um, so that, that gives you uh, an idea that he's talking about everybody in the world should be praising God. Of course, they don't until the kingdom comes in its, in its completeness. And every every That's exactly right. So that day will come. But still, we call all people to praise God. So that's PowerPoint number 17, gives you an idea of what Psalm 17 is about. And of course, we just did Psalm 113 then together, walking through that. Let's look at another type of psalm. This is PowerPoint number 18. PowerPoint number 18 refers to wisdom psalms, or this is a reference or looking at wisdom psalms. Wisdom psalms are those which contrast the blessedness of serving God versus the folly of rejecting him, or they discuss the benefits of serving God. I love owls. I got my little wise old owl there with the... You know, the, the, what do you call that, the mortar board hat or whatever those are called? I graduated 15 times and can't remember what that hat's called. But anyway. <laughs> Took me 15 years to graduate. <laughs> Seemed like. You're coming back again next year, Spa. Oh, man. But anyway. You know, I knew I was, I knew that I wasn't graduating when my teacher said to me, see you next year, Einstein. No, I graduated. I'm just teasing. I, I... <laughs> but anyway, they discuss the benefits of serving God or they talk about how, you know, the blessedness of serving God. At times they have philosophical elements as a psalmist ponders theological questions. And we won't go into this necessarily, but Psalm 73, why am I not being blessed? Bad guys are being blessed. It's a philosophical question. Why do the righteous suffer and the evil prosper? Okay. So some, sometimes the philosophical questions come up. They often incorporate proverbial statements or concepts that are reminiscent of the book of Proverbs. And the classic example of a wisdom psalm is Psalm 1, also Psalm 36, Psalm 37, 49, already mentioned 73, 112, 127, 128, and 133 are all wisdom psalms. A classic example of wisdom psalms is Psalm 1. Now, Psalm 1, of course, is the very first psalm. And it sort of sets the stage for the entire book of Psalms because it just talks about how blessed it is to, to worship God and to obey his word and to listen to what he has to say. So there's a description of the blessed man, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. There is the blessed man. Somebody who remains what? Verse 1 describes a man who is what? It starts, the word starts with an H. What kind of man is this? Holy man. A holy man. Or a godly man. Now I want you to know too, this is a great insight. I forget who it was. It might have been Derek Kidner in his commentary on Psalms. He says, notice this. First of all, he says he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. First of all, he's kind of going through the wickedness. Then he stands in the path of sinners like he's stopped to actually indulge in it. But then finally, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He's become well ensconced in the evil of this world. I'm not sure that's what the... Because this is obviously the parallelism we talked about last week. But, but I'm not quite sure that the psalmist meant that when he wrote this, but it does make good preaching stuff. <laughs> you know, the idea of, you know, we don't want to, you know, I'm, I think I'll try this for, I'm going to walk in this for a while. Of course, walk generally means a consistent day-to-day -day attitude. So I'm not sure that, the, you know, that the, 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 the illustration that, that Derek Kidner was using holds up. But we never want to be in that situation where, it's our day-to-day -day mode of operandi where we're just identifying ourselves with wickedness. 
we all occasionally fall, right? But we don't want to stand or sit or walk in those ways. So it's a holy man. Now, what are the benefits? Verse 3, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. So that's the, that, that's the benefit of the blessed man. And then he gives a description of the wicked man. He already gave the description of the blessed man and the benefits of being a blessed man. Now let's describe the wicked man, verse 4. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. They're not like the tree that's bringing forth fruit. They're like the useless stuff that's left over at, at harvest when you're threshing out your wheat and you just want to get rid of that junk because it's worthless. Then there's a curse. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Then there is a final contrast between the two in verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. What does it mean to know in Scripture? Mine has watches over. Okay. If I know someone, that can mean one of two things. It means I'm familiar with them or I have a very close connection and love for them in scripture especially and Adam knew his wife hi Eve how you doing that's not what it means and she bore him a son right Could it be I mean, that's it part of it as well see if, 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 it, if it merely means God knows all about the guy well he knows all about the wicked too but notice the diff, notice this is this is antithetical parallelism here the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked shall perish. Knows and perish are in antithesis to one another. To perish means to be cast off as worthless. It means to be uh, to eventually go to hell if you if you take the full perspective of Scripture. Therefore, to know would mean to have God's blessing, to have His salvation, to have His love, to have His security. So that's why it's important to notice this this parallelism that we talked about last week because the word no you understand what it means by contrasting it with what it doesn't mean perish so we might say this the lord protects acknowledges and uh and and uh, delights in the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will eventually come to ruin destruction and worthlessness God will take to heaven the righteous, but the wicked will go to hell. So you could say, like, knoweth, knows, it means intimacy. Right. Perish means separation. Right. That's a good way of putting it. Actually, that's very good. I'd give you a star, too. Um, the idea is because if perish means, you know, to be cast out, whereas no means you're walking arm in arm. There's that closeness of fellowship. Because if it, if it merely means mental acknowledgement or awareness in your head, well, God knows that about the wicked also. So it must mean something different than merely to have a mental picture. Oh, yeah, that guy's, that guy, I, yeah, I know all about that good guy down there. It means more than that. Because he, God can say that about the wicked people. All right. Now what I want you to do, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have you do this right now. We're gonna go ahead and finish this lesson up here, uh, pretty quick. I got a couple more pages to go and be done. But I want you, as an exercise, to go home and outline Psalm 112 or 120. Yeah, 112. Okay. Psalm 112 is another wisdom psalm. Work on this together if you want to. It's ten verses long. And I want you to outline it. Now again, the elements might not be quite the same as Psalm 1. You've got the description of the blessed man, the benefit of the blessed man, the description of the wicked man, the curse of the wicked man, the contrast between the two. Those elements are in that wisdom psalm. Again, there's not going to necessarily be a one-to-one -one correlation between Psalm 1 and Psalm 112. But look for those same basic kind of elements. And then outline accordingly. Then look up the meaning or think about the meaning, the implications, and the significance. Also, what sorts of things does the righteous man do to be considered a righteous man? And also, is there any proverbial wisdom here that is not always true without exception? 
See, that's, we haven't gotten into Proverbs yet. But Proverbs are just that. They're Proverbs. They're rules of thumb. They don't necessarily, you know, he who hesitates is lost. Is that always true? No, because the race is to the swiftest. Well, I mean, he who hesitates is lost can be counterbalanced by look before you leap. They can't be both right at the same time in the same situation in the same way, but they're both rules of thumb that we use. And that's true of, you know, the godly will never starve. Are you sure? The righteous will never know pain. They will live to be a long year, you know, to an old age. Is that true? Not always. And not only that, there, there are people who are hell on wheels that might live to be 95 years old. You know, the, the, the wicked come to a disastrous and quick end. Not necessarily. That's one of the struggles with Psalm 73, by the way. How come it is that godly people are seemingly are the ones that oftentimes come to the destructive ends? You know, they die devastating deaths. They lose their children. Misery comes their way when sometimes the wicked are fat and sassy up to their dying day. Maybe because of eternity and faith. And that, that's part of it. Part of it is we're, we need to look at things from the perspective of eternity because the 90 years that we might have on this earth, the 75 years we have on this earth, however long you might live on this earth, is nothing in comparison to eternity. You have to take that all into consideration. But also, again, it's rules of thumb. If you work hard, if you save your money, if you do what's right, if you drive your car safely, if you, know, you eat right, chances are you're going to live to be a ripe old age. But there are a lot of people that have done all those good things and you can get struck by lightning and die today. By the same token, you might be a guy that, you know, is a, just, like I said, hell on wheels and, you know, takes drugs and smokes and, and you know, drinks his liver to shrivel it up and, uh, you know, rides his motorcycle without a helmet and pulls wheelies at 90 mile an hour and dodges in and out of cars and, Hey, next thing you know, you know he's he's 90 years old, and my uh, boy, I had a lot of fun over my life. Well, yeah. Well, what's the next hundred trillion zillion squillion years going to be for you? And and counting forever. Squillion. <laughs> <laughs> Am I being too technical for you when I use the word squillion? Squillion. Yes. <laughs> he lost That's right. He lost me Yeah. Yeah. You know. So. So, yeah, th these things are rules of thumb anyway. That's the point that I'm making. Um, there are a lot of godly people. You know, God will protect me in battle, David said. A lot of godly people have been killed in battle. Jesus said a proverb, He who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. Is that true? Most soldiers live to be ripe old men. Right? A lot of them die in combat. But uh, that doesn't necessarily, it's not always so, but it's, it's a general truth. The idea is if you're going to go look for trouble, trouble will find you. <laughs> you know, it's going to heal. Your sins will find you out eventually. Maybe not in this life, but they will eventually. So anyway, Royal Psalms. This is uh, PowerPoint number, oh, I forgot about PowerPoint uh, number 19, which is uh, the uh, classic example of wisdom psalm, is Psalm 1. I keep forgetting to do the PowerPoints. I even have them marked, and I have them in red and everything in my notes, and I just I keep forgetting to mention them for people who might be Schooling watching. Schooling different ways. Schooling different, different ways. I've got these things yeah. marked, and I can never remember to. I have a little pop-up thing when I open my, it's like one of those pop-up birthday cards. Boing! Yeah, and then remind me to remind you to, to, to turn to the uh, next PowerPoint online. But anyway, Royal Psalms, which is PowerPoint number 20. Remember the old Imperial Margarine commercials? Doesn't that look like the Imperial Margarine? Yeah. Hey, he says nickels are so corny. So he bite into a piece of bread with a margarine on the crown would appear in her head. <laughs> yeah. Though some would not classify these as distinct type of psalms, they contain a royal element where the king plays a prominent role. They either involve God's power upon the king or his anointed or exalt God as king. Psalm 2. Psalm 20, 21, 45. My own personal favorite psalm, Psalm 72, is a royal psalm. 89, 110, 
and 132. Now, we just read Psalm 110 in church on Sunday, remember? Uh, yeah, you are a priest. Saint, yeah. What's that? I, I should. I need to. I need to have somebody run the sound for me in church, and I also need to have a lapel mic. That'd be great. And Psalm one thirty two are often classified as royal psalms. Now, in addition to these being royal in their subject matter, some of these may also be considered messianic psalms. Actually, I got ahead of myself a little bit, but let's look at Psalm seventy two just as an example. Turn to Psalm seventy two. Why would you consider this a royal psalm? <laughs> Somebody tell me why you would consider this a royal psalm. Talking about the royal son. <laughs> yeah. Give the king your right judgment. Oh, God, that's a pretty good indication right there, right, Randy? And your righteousness to the king's son. Exactly. Verse 1 tips you right off. And then it goes on, may his reign continue, may his reign, and I, I think this has a messianic element to it. Uh, the idea, it sounds like the kingdom age, where wickedness will be vanquished. So, yep, all, you know, all these things that are mentioned about the king. And he will, he will be a great judge, he will deliver the needy when he cries for help the afflicted also, and him who has no helper. He will have compassion on the poor and needy and the lives of the needy he will save. So that all this is kingly stuff. Justice and righteousness will rule. Psalm 20 is another one that you can look at on your own. But some of these are messianic. Look at, uh, and I think, like I said, 72 has an element of, of uh, a messianic psalm. But also, I want you to look at Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Anointed. Who, who is anointed in the Old Testament? Priests and kings. Okay. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. You know, so they're talking out. Of, the anointed is what? The Messiah. That's what the word Messiah, anointed, means. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're synonymous terms. Now, the, the word Messiah didn't necessarily uh, mean Jesus. You know, there were other messiahs. There were other anointed people, as it were. But uh, this, is, this is talking more cosmically, I think. Because it's, it's talking about rebellion against the Lord and his anointed let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And that over and over and over again in the New Testament looks you know, to Jesus Christ. That It's fulfilled in him. So that's why this is considered a messianic psalm. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. The very ends of the earth is your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. It's not like judgment over the earth. So it sounds like the messianic age, the kingdom, at the yet to come at the end of the age. Of course, there are messianic references in several psalms, including some that are not royal. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus said that from the cross. Now, it could be that he was just quoting that psalm, but it also could be that the psalmist, in a sense, was foreshadowing that, especially as you go on, it says they cast lots for my clothes and all that sort of stuff. That, that's in Psalm 22. So that could also have a, there's a, there is a messianic element in that. But it's not necessarily, the entire psalm is not necessarily messianic, whereas Psalm 2 is primarily a messianic psalm. But anyway, we need to be careful not to read too much into a psalm. As a rule of thumb, we should see as the greatest evidence that a psalm is messianic if the New Testament refers to it as such. Oh, I see. You're, you know, answer me when I call. Well, somebody called upon Jesus, and, and uh, he answered, so that must be messianic. No, 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 no. That's reading too much into it. You know, be gracious to me. Well, Jesus gives us his grace, therefore it's messianic. No, it's not. But if the New Testament says, 
Jesus' ministry fulfilled Psalm 110, you are a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, then clearly when the New Testament affirms it, then that's a, that's a dead giveaway, obviously. Don't read too much into a psalm. And there are people who they will find, a, you know, a reference to Jesus in every syllable in the Old Testament. And that, that comes close to just the allegorizing that we talked about when we talked about parables some time ago. Uh, we're going to find hidden meanings that nobody else ever saw before. Aren't I smart? No, you're probably stupid. But I shouldn't say that. People online get the wrong impression about me. I'm pretty, I'm pretty harmless. But anyway, um, we just want to make sure that we're not smarter than the Bible. All right. Finally, there's imprecatory psalms. Imprecatory psalms are another class of psalms. These provide a special dilemma for the Christians as they call down death and destruction upon the psalmist's enemies. Turn to Psalm 58. Psalm 58. This is PowerPoint number 21. Psalm 58. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? Now, this is not talking about false gods here. This is not talking about Marduk and Ashtaroth and Milcom and all those different kinds of gods. Sometimes in the scriptures, somebody who was put in a position of authority was called a god. Not in a cosmic sense, but in a practical sense, in the sense that you have authority and rule over us. Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? So see, O gods and sons of men are parallel in that. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, a, 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 an example of synonymous parallelism. Speak righteousness and judge uprightly are parallel, and O gods and O sons of men. That's why in your, in your Bible it'll have a small g. It's not talking about God himself. No, in heart you work in righteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or a skillful, ca skillful caster of spells. O oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Again, that's figurative language. Young lions would be these destructive and hateful and self-serving rulers. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. In other words, when he tries to hurt somebody, make it so that nothing comes of it. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never sees the sun. That's kind of an ugly thought. And it really is. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with the whirlwind, the green, and the burning alike. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. That's kind of a macabre thought as well. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Psalm 83 is another imprecatory psalm. We already noticed Psalm 137. There's an imprecation there. And there are other places too. Psalm 35, 3 through 8 is an imprecation. Psalm 69, 22 to 28. Okay. These aren't always seen as a distinct class of psalms. There are imprecations throughout the psalms, right? But here's my question for you. How do we reconcile these imprecations with the Sermon on the Mount where we are told to love our enemies? This is not easy, friends. This is, we're getting into the meat of the word here now, the gang. The difference I see is that the psalmist is asking God to, to meet out. You are on a roll. You are on a roll. That is a big part of this, I think. If you go through and read these imprecations, he's not saying, I can't wait until I bury my fist in the face of that right. jerk. Right. right. He's saying, you, God, take right. care of this. Right. Graphic. It's graphic language, but again, it's language that is the language of their day. Mm -hmm. Psalm 137, as a matter of fact, is interesting because I think that is an allusion back to the book of Isaiah. I can't remember the exact verse, 
but where it says dash your little ones against the stone, Babylon, that's what's going to happen to you. Blessed is the one who's going to do that. God predicts in the book of Isaiah that that's what's going to happen to Babylon. They will have back on their heads what they did to other people. So when the psalmist says, how blessed is the person who's going to do that to you, what he's saying is, in a sense, is God's word is going to be fulfilled. The one who carries out God's judgment upon these people. So that, that's, that's part of it, certainly. The psalmist appeals to God for vengeance, but, but does not seek to take vengeance into his own hands. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We're not to take the law into our own hands, as much as we would like to sometimes. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23. You know, Jesus did not, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. But he entrusted himself to the God who judges righteously. And the psalmist is doing the same thing. He's not saying, oh boy, I just, I, I can't, I, I, I just lay awake at night thinking of ways that I can pull the wings off that fly, figuratively speaking. Another thing, too, that we ought to keep in mind. <clears throat> one, one more thing, Revelation 6, 9 through 10. Remember, remember that, the, the, the people who have been beheaded for Christ's sake in the book of Revelation, how long, O oh Lord, until you take vengeance on our enemies? They don't say, let us go back to earth. <laughs> and let us fix it. They ask God to do justice. Also, perhaps we should see imprecations as the psalmist's inner cry for justice. They are his intimate secret appeals to God on a more cosmic level. In his own secret closet of prayer, this guy, not publicly going out and mouthing off, he's going to God in prayer. In a sense, he is publicly because he's become songs. But they are his secret appeals to God on a cosmic level. You take care of it as the judge of all the earth. On the other hand, the Sermon on the Mount is a practical day-to-day -day guidebook on living the kingdom life. All of us want justice done, but recognize we are to love our enemies. That's part of this as well. So, in a sense, don't the... Don't the don't the imprecatory psalms just show you the other side of God's character? Is God a God of love? Sure. Is God a God of wrath? Sure. Okay. Is it wrong for us to want justice done? No. Is it wrong for us to be vindictive? Yes. 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 And there's the difference. And perhaps, too, we can look at these imprecations as a sanctified letting off steam. Boy, oh boy, God, would you smash this guy? I am so sick and tired of him. Now I feel better. You know, and I trust you, Lord, that you're going to take care of it. But we're not supposed to rejoice when that happens. And, and, and it's exactly right. He, he, we're, we're to rejoice that justice is done, but we're not supposed to take joy over the destruction of the wicked. But we, we can, you know, if, if somebody is sent to the gas chamber or, you know, they're given a lethal injection, we pity that guy and we pity his family. But we can also say we rejoice in justice being done if it's indeed clearly the case that this guy was guilty and he deserves the, the, the death penalty. Or it could just be a five-year sentence you know, for robbery or something. But we can rejoice. We don't want that guy to go to jail. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not rejoice over the death of the wicked. I do not take pleasure over the death of the wicked, God says in the book of Ezekiel. But according to God's justice, the, just, the wicked still die. So there's a sense in which we have, we have to kind of straddle that fence or walk that tightrope where we want justice done, but not vindictiveness. We want, we want to see righteousness prevail, but not vengeance. So and sometimes I think that the psalmist is like any other human being. They let off steam. All of us occasionally cry out to God in pain and frustration. And the psalms are real manifestations of human emotions where God is addressed honestly. You know, some guy does something bad to you. You can put a smile on it, and we, we should try to put a smile on, but God knows our heart, so why can't we just tell him how we really think and feel? Right. But we should suppress that because we know it's wrong to act upon it ourselves. So it is a sense, again, going into God, letting off steam in our secret closet of prayer, but then living as he would have us to live in that non-vindictive manner. Cutting to the chase here. Now I want you to, and we're not going to necessarily do this right now. 
I want you to read the following psalms and classify them. What type are they? And where appropriate are they individual or corporate? Excuse me, descriptive or narrative? And here they are. I'll give you this again, so just in case you miss it. I'll read that again, and then I'll give you the numbers. Read the following psalms and classify them. What type are they, and where appropriate are they individual or corporate, descriptive or narrative? Or whatever. Psalm 5. Oh, do I already? There you go. Psalm 5, 21, 43, 49, 73. I already told you 73, but... Okay. We can do one together real quick. Let's go to Psalm. Let's go to Psalm. Uh, well, some of these I know off the top of my head. So let's go to one that I don't necessarily know. Right off, let's go to Psalm 43. That's one that I don't. Like I said, I, I know some of these. Psalm 73 I know. Psalm 100 I know. Psalm 5. I'm pretty sure I know what that one is. But let's look at Psalm 43. Which says, okay, very good. It's individual. What else? What, what would verse 2 tend to give you? What indication would verse 2 give you? Lament. Yeah, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And again, I, individual. Individual lament psalm. So that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about here. Okay? Any questions or comments? We're, we're done as far as, as far as our YouTube is concerned here, so we'll just go ahead and, and stop this. But anybody have any questions or comments over anything? We're done.